Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. Today I'm bringing to you Professor Javier Gonzalez from the University of Bath. He's an up and coming uh, researcher in carbohydrate metabolism. He's been rapidly promoted to professor. He's been doing great work all around carbohydrate metabolism, the effect of different types of carbohydrate on your glucose levels, your gl muscle glycogen uh, resynthesis, your liver glycogen levels, etc. So, you know, we compare and contrast glucose and glycogen metabolism at rest. And then during exercise, when you've had a meal or you haven't had a meal, and then also talking about uh, the effect of exercise on glycogen resynthesis of, in the liver and the muscle, and what difference it makes, if any, uh, in, in regards to what sort of carbohydrate you ingest. So whether it's glucose or fructose or uh, glucose and fructose, which is sucrose, um, what effect it has on your liver glycogen and your muscle glycogen. Also, the effect of different amounts of carbohydrate. So everything around carbohydrate availability before, during, and after exercise. We also touched a little bit on some of the work he's been doing recently on ketone supplementation during exercise and whether it affects erythropoietin, so EPO, which you may have heard of uh, in regards to red blood cells and athletes. So stick around. I think you'll really enjoy this one. Javier, how are you? Thanks for coming along to Inside Exercise. I'm great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good. So you're in, you're in Bath, actually. I've only been to London. It's pretty lame. Where is Bath? My wife went there and said there's all these Roman baths. Not su no, surprisingly. But, yeah, yeah, it's a lovely, lovely city southwest of England. So kind of near to Bristol, if you know that. Okay, not really. But uh, I, I, I get you. <laughs> I had a former, former postdoc. He's down in Plymouth. Yeah, not far. That's much yeah, further yeah. down, I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk about how does exercise affect metabolism after eating? Yeah. And as you know, I've really enjoyed you do these sort of threads on Twitter. I, I never used to use Twitter. And what is it called? A thread? Yeah. Threads on Twitter where you talk about, you know, if you had a meal and then exercise or exercise and have a meal, really nice stuff. Um, so we'll talk a lot about that. That'll be the main focus. But I'm often interested in how did people even get into exercise research? Were you like an exercise -y, sporty type initially or were you a scientist or what happened? Yeah, I guess it all started as a teenager. I was really into sport, mainly rugby union. And um, when my parents were out at work and I had to get ready for training, I'd start making my own food and um, thought, well, I was always competitive as well. And so <laughs> any advantage yeah. I could get, um, I'd try and seek it out. And um, at that time, I guess I was reading that high impact journal, Men's Health magazine. Um, oh, to yes. get my science. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> and um, wasn't wasn't a great student at school, actually, but was interested in sport and in and in diet. And um, so I studied sport and exercise science as an undergrad and mm -hmm. then carried on for a master's in exercise physiology. And I was actually respiratory physiology, uh, mainly to to try and expose myself to the best research skills actually because at the institution I was at their expertise was, was respiratory physiology and um, funnily enough some of the techniques have come in useful for nutrition now because we were using these nasogastric um, catheters oh, yes. that go up your nose down your throat and into your stomach done that done that yeah and that was to measure diaphragm force production um, oh. but nowadays we're using it for nasogastric feeding so mm. um yeah it has come in useful there you go um yeah and then went on to a phd in nutrition um under emma stevenson at, at northumbria and newcastle um stayed up there for a postdoc and then came down to bath and i've been down here for the last eight years well i have to say as well you've been doing rapid progress there so um all over Twitter and uh, eight eight years since you've been at Bath and you've gone from lecturer to, to professor very recently, yeah? Yeah, full, that's right. Full yeah. professor. Yeah. I always have to yeah. say full professor because the Americans think everyone's a professor, yeah? Assistant, yeah. Yeah. so a bit full professor, that's great. All right, so why don't we start off, before we think about uh, the effect of, you know, eating on metabolism with exercise, why don't we just think about what's happening just normally with, with um you know, you're after eating, what happens? And then, you know, we'll start to superimpose exercise on top of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I always like to start actually just before we eat. So if we wake up first yes. thing in the morning, uh, then um, we've got our, our glucose concentration, the, the blood sugar. Um, and we might have about five grams or so in our blood. Um, 
but actually that <laughs> what's underlying that is is flux so it's not static um we've constantly got about 10 grams per hour of glucose exiting the circulation and about half of that is going to the brain half of it going to other tissues and so if that none was coming into the circulation at that time we'd run out of glucose within about half an hour or so um, and in that state the liver is basically providing all of the glucose and it's breaking down its own store of carbohydrate from glycogen and it's also producing glucose from other substrates so things like amino acids and um, about that, that's about a 50 50 contribution so the the liver's providing glucose 50 percent from its own stores and 50 percent by this gluconeogenesis which is that production of, of glucose from other sources um then when we eat a meal things change quite drastically so the liver and the muscle are the main tissues that respond to that meal the liver will respond more quickly than the muscle and what it will do is it will suppress the amount of glucose that's coming out of the liver and it will also start to increase the storage of glucose in the liver as glycogen so it's gone from net production to net uptake and mm. the muscle also starts to increase the amount of glucose that it's taking up out of the circulation beautiful all right so we'll flesh these things out as we go of course so um all right so what happens then if you hang on so what are we going to talk about here you have the meal and then you exercise or do you want to talk about exercising and have the meal or both <laughs> can do both yeah yeah okay um so i guess okay so you've talked about uh so you've you know woken up overnight and the, the other thing i guess which is interesting is is overnight your liver actually gets quite depleted yeah right what are they yeah. saying nowadays like 80 percent or something uh, not not quite that much actually the most mm. recent estimates are about 30 percent is that all um yeah okay. yeah yeah well, but muscle doesn't really deplete at all of course because it's yeah mainly using fatty acids exactly right and that's the other thing in case we forget later people yeah. tend to say oh you know um if i don't eat much for a couple of days my glycogen will be gone but it, it doesn't it's, yeah. it's sufficient it's no use you've yeah. used energy to put it in there so you'll leave it there generally yeah. all right yeah. so as you said so you've woken up you've had your breakfast um and this might bring me back to something later as well as um often studies are done fasted uh, so you know the results you might get when you do studies fasted versus after but let's assume yeah. the person's got up they've had breakfast yeah and then they go for a run so what's going to happen to their glucose and fat and whatever compared to if they hadn't gone for a run sort of thing yeah yeah so yeah if you if you do yeah run or walk or anything after eating a meal um mm -hmm. then it's quite a powerful way to reduce the blood glucose concentration so when you eat a meal, of course, that, that blood glucose is going to rise slightly as you, before your body starts to buffer all of those processes. Um, but if you exercise, then you can increase the rate of glucose uptake into muscle um, quite potently. And that will lower the blood glucose concentration if you're starting with an, an elevated glucose concentration to begin with. Um, yep. And the, the way it does that is, is through multiple mechanisms. And of course, a lot of your work has, has contributed to that. So things like increased blood flow, perfusion, um, some GLUT4 translocation, so the transporters that allow the glucose to enter the muscle cells, mm -hmm. and also the intracellular metabolism as well. So because all of the glucose in the muscle is being used, um, we can change the concentration gradient and maintain a good concentration gradient from outside to inside the muscle. All right, so to summarize as we go along here, so... So yeah, you see, you get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, and assuming there's carbohydrate in your in your breakfast, um, which you know, looking at Twitter, you can't always assume that. Or more more of dinner, it's kind of steaks, but uh, glucose goes up, yeah. And then yeah. you have, you know, we haven't really talked about it much, but insulin's released from the pancreas as you sort of, and then that stimulates glucose uptake by the muscle and inhibits the in glucose from release from the liver, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the glucose comes down, yeah. Now you're yeah. saying if you start exercise when that glucose is already up and the insulin's already up. Um, then the glucose will be taken up faster but do you actually get like a, a hypo can you actually go hyper? yeah 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 some people can get a transient hypoglycemia when they do that because you've got the insulin that's driving muscle glucose uptake and then you superimpose on top of that the exercise induced glucose uptake and you can get this this small period where you get hypoglycemia um, and people can feel kind of a, a little bit um, anxious in that state and get tunnel vision um, but in most healthy people they've got a normal counter-regulatory response 
yeah. you get a glucagon released and that has the opposing effects and your blood glucose normalizes quite quickly again beautiful and this will bring me to one of the, the your your nice twitter um so you if people haven't seen this uh javier will do something like he'll put a figure up with um um, some glucose, glucose is, you know, across time and then say, oh, what do you think is going on here? So you had a nice one where you said if you had 25 grams of, uh, I think it was glucose versus 50 grams versus 75 grams, what yeah. sort of pattern would you expect in the glucose levels? Yeah. And I yeah. think most people got that wrong. <laughs> so why don't you explain that there? That's, that's pretty nice stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess this is what I love about metabolism and, and the kind of integrative physiology perspective, because and it, and it constantly challenges my own beliefs where you might expect that the 75 grams of glucose produces a bigger blood glucose concentration than the 25 grams of glucose. But um, at least in this study, and it, it's in healthy people, um, those, those blood glucose concentrations were pretty much the same, regardless of that amount of glucose that was ingested. And that's because um, that whilst the rate of appearance of glucose into the circulation was higher with the 75 grams versus the 25 grams, the larger insulin response to the 75 grams meant that there was a compensatory increase in glucose disappearance out of the circulation into muscle, um, which means that the blood glucose concentration didn't differ. And I think this has... Um, implications for understanding things like the glycemic index in response to food so we get different foods that have different glycemic indices and normally that's because a food might be more slowly digested and absorbed compared to another food but um, there are some foods that are more slowly digested so for example if you compare spaghetti mm -hmm. to bread um, and the, there are studies with traces that have, have, under, that have tried to establish this where the spaghetti is more slowly digested and absorbed, but the blood glucose response is pretty much the same because it produces a lower insulin response. So you actually need quite large changes in the digestion rate to actually see it in blood glucose. Whereas if we measure flux, then it, it's much more sensitive to detect those changes. Right. So I'm glad you've, been, you've mentioned traces and flux and things. So I think this is a really important thing. And again, just to make sure people are on the same page. So, so for example, when you start exercise, as you as you know, obviously, just say if glucose is five millimoles per liter, you start exercise, it won't really even change if you're doing submax exercise. Yeah. And you might think, oh, nothing's going on. But, yeah. but what's actually happening is, and as, as you've alluded to, is you're releasing more glucose from the liver and you're taking out more glucose from the muscle by the muscle. And it's the same, right? Yeah. So you really need to know this flux. So why don't you explain how you actually do with without going too crazy over the top, you know, with you know formulas yeah. or whatever. How do you um, work out this flux with traces and things like that? Yeah, I guess it's it, probably the simplest place to start is in a steady state condition. So if yes. you imagine that moderate intensity, continuous exercise, you, you're just jogging at a, a relatively comfortable pace. Um, in that scenario, um, what we do is we um, we put a cannula in a vein and we introduce a tracer, which is basically the same molecule as glucose, but we can detect it. So it's labeled. So it's normally slightly heavier, but it behaves pretty much the same as all the glucose in our body. Um, and it's called the dilution principle. So um, we know the infusion rate. We know how much labeled glucose is going into the circulation. And the more glucose that's being released from our liver, the more that our tracer will be diluted. And so if we measure the ratio of our tracer, to our tracy, which is the unlabeled glucose, then um, the higher that ratio, the less glucose is coming out of the liver, um, the less our endogenous glucose production, because we've got a high tracer tracy ratio. Whereas the lower that is, the more diluted it is by the, the glucose that's coming out of the liver. So I guess that's one of the kind of first key principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you can imagine you, so what, I, what I, quite often happens is you might do a fusion at rest. So if you're doing exercise, you're doing fusion at rest or before you have a meal and the tracer gets to sort of like a steady state equilibrium. And then if you start exercise, the thing I often say, which which I think is kind of nice to get your head around, is that the, you've got this tracer of glucose, which is, like you say, slightly modified. And then the liver releases normal glucose, so it dilutes the tracer. Yeah. So you can imagine if it dilutes it at a fast rate, then you're releasing a lot of glucose from the liver if it dilutes at a slow rate. 
And then you just need to measure the concentration of glucose. Yeah. And if the glucose is going down, then it means that the glucose release from the liver must be less than the muscle glucose uptake. So yeah, it's really, it's really nice stuff. And the other, you can also talk about having blue water in a bath and turning on the tap and all that stuff. So there's all these different analogies. But anyway, the bottom line is pretty nice. And I've done some of this stuff as well. And there are a few assumptions and things, but let's not, let's not worry about that too much. I think, and you touched on the steady state. So if it's not steady, why don't you just say a little bit about that, I guess, or maybe it gets too complicated. So if it's hard exercise, it's not steady state, whatever. There's yeah. Not, so yeah. A, lot, a lot of the kind of principles of traces become a, a little bit, well, I guess the assumptions um, get pushed under non-steady yeah, exactly. state conditions. And there's a few yeah. things you can do like, um, um different equations um yeah, taking yeah, into yeah. account the concentration also um some people can introduce uh, extra traces as well to, to yes. account for that um beautiful yeah yeah, yeah. all right um, now one thing i was i feel like mine is a bit low tech nowadays we would we would put the tracer on the hydrogen so yeah. people would a lot of people would know that glucose is um you know six um six carbons 12 hydrogens um six oxygens we would just make one of the hydrogens a little bit heavier so as, mm -hmm. as you said, you know, it doesn't really, it's been shown not to affect the metabolism, but you put yours on the carbon. So yeah, why don't you just say why that's kind of nifty? You know, you can measure the expired air. If I did that, it's, it's no use. Yeah. Yeah. I guess this comes down to, yeah, the study design and the outcomes mm -hmm. you're interested in. So if you are interested in the amount of the glucose that you're burning as a fuel, then as you say, one of the things you can do is label the carbon on that glucose molecule. When you, ingest that carbon uh the carbon labeled glucose then if it's stored in your body it won't come out on the breath that you expire whereas if you're burning it as a fuel it'll actually appear on your exhaled breath and the carbon dioxide so the carbon yeah. on that carbon dioxide will, will now be labeled so then you can measure how much of the ingested glucose has been stored versus burned as a fuel yeah yeah i'm starting to get geeky here but i was i was, I was also thinking it's nifty that people have done where you can label the different carbons yeah or label and, and you can actually yeah. work out did it go through gluconeogenesis or not but let's not get too exactly. geeky on that what i wanted to want to say was your nice example there of having 25 grams of glucose 50 75 what would you expect uh if that was done at rest versus during exercise yeah um so probably a relatively similar glucose response mm -hmm. um you might get a bit of that transient hypoglycemia um, as, as we discussed, because they're relatively small yeah, true. boluses that, that would stimulate a little insulin response, but not provide uh -huh. enough glucose to, to counteract that. Yeah. Um, probably also differs whether you have them before or after exercise as well. So we get quite, quite big differences in the metabolic response to having that glucose. If we have it after exercise, for example. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've done work on this, but when I was doing this sort of stuff, back in the day holy crap uh when was that 1995 and six and whatever the prevailing view was then you know you could only really have about one gram per hour of glucose or carbohydrate basically um otherwise you'd get upset stomach and whatever so i know you and people like oscar you and droop and whatever have, have you know mucked around looking at glucose versus fructose versus sucrose which is you know glucose and fructose what do you think nowadays and maybe just throw in this, these sort of concepts of what's happening with glucose, what's happening to fructose and, and how much you, you reckon you can actually pack in there per hour if you're exercising. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, as you, as you say, back in the day, um, it was thought that the maximum rate that we could ingest and actually metabolize carbohydrate during exercise was about one gram per minute or 60 grams an hour. Um, and it was actually quite a lot of the work done by Asker You Can Drip showing mm -hmm. that if you ingest different types and mixtures of, of carbohydrates, um, then you can increase that rate up to about 1.7 grams per minute, or at least 90 grams an hour, maybe a little bit more. Um, and it's probably because uh, the glucose um, is mainly transported by one specific transport protein in the intestine, known as SGLT1 or sodium dependent glucose transporter one um, and that's like a door to enter the circulation and if you imagine you've only got a certain number of doors then that's going to be saturated at a certain rate of glucose delivery whereas if you add fructose into the mix 
then that uses a different door to enter the circulation known as GLUT5. And so if you've got two entry points rather than one, you can get more total carbohydrate into the circulation. Um, there are some other differences with fructose and glucose related to the liver that um, maybe we can chat about later, but certainly during exercise, that's probably one of the main ways in which combining different mixtures of carbohydrates can increase the total amount that we can ingest and metabolize from about 60 grams per hour up to 90 grams per hour or more. Okay, so I guess the point there is that it, it can be absorbed. So if you do those studies and have the 90 grams just of glucose or 90 grams just of fructose, fructose does it not work? Do they get upset stomachs? Do they not, you know, get it taken up or, you know? Yeah, exactly that. So if you're if you're ingesting a lot more than the maximal capacity, then it's going to hang around in the intestine start to cause delayed gastric emptying and um, potentially cramping and, and things like that. So yeah, not oh. abdominal cramping. So, I like your yeah. analogies there with the, the door. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to remember that, you know, you're one door for glucose and one door for, for uh, fruit, uh, fructose, et cetera. All right. So the other thing we wanted to think about is um, I might bounce around a bit as I remember things, but we've talked about uh, the carbohydrate ingestion during the exercise. What about glycogen? Often, you know, obviously people are often interested in, especially athletes, glycogen resynthesis after exercise both in the liver and the muscle i know you've done some really nice work on that so um what do you say about that yeah so um a lot a lot of these studies looking at different ways of restoring glycogen in liver and muscle are aimed at the endurance athlete who might need to perform multiple times in a day or at least two times within 24 hours and so most of the goal of these studies is to see how quickly can we replenish those stores. And um, with muscle, there's been quite a lot of research over the years done. Um, with liver, it's a little bit trickier to study. We can't biopsy the liver quite so easily. And so we can't see what's going on there. Um, but some of the work that we've done is tried to understand what's going on. And um, we use magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is where you basically take an MRI scanner and it's been adapted in both the hardware and the software. And you can then non-invasively measure liver glycogen concentrations. And what we found um, was that if you ingest a mixture of glucose and fructose after exercise, then you can increase the amount of glycogen stored in the liver compared to the same amount of carbohydrate if it was glucose only. And Part of that might be related to that di rate of digestion absorption that we just mentioned, but probably the mechanism there is more to do with the way that fructose is handled by the liver, because mm -hmm. whereas glucose can be readily taken up by muscle, um, fructose can't be easily metabolized by muscle. And so the liver is a main organ that metabolizes fructose and it normally converts it into, into glucose, into lactate into glycogen or even into to fatty acids as well i'm glad you actually said that about lactate because one of the first when i was doing my undergrad this is 1986 to 1989 we had to do um liter literature reviews and somehow i came across the indirect pathway in in the liver yeah so how the liver i don't know if they still think this but you tend to think you know you have carbohydrate and it goes because it goes through the portal vein through the liver you yeah. think the liver will just yeah. take it up but a yeah. lot of it goes through yeah. And and uh, why don't you flesh that out? But it felt like the idea was the muscle would then get the first shot at it. So yeah. so it would sort of go through and then get converted lactate in the muscle and then get taken up by the liver. Is that? Yeah. What do you so, think? Yeah. That? I mean, there's a few. Yeah, the liver is fascinating. I guess there's, mm. there's two really interesting points there. I think one is that, that indirect versus direct glycogen synthesis in the liver where you've got the carbohydrate that's been ingested directly going to glycogen or you've got um, glycogen being stored from gluconeogenesis that um, is the non-carbohydrate sources um, but also the liver and actually most areas of metabolism are not just binary on and off and mm -hmm. constantly both processes are happening so in the liver you might have glycogen synthesis and glycogen breakdown both going on at the same time it's just the balance of those two is mm -hmm. shifted um, and so for example when you eat a meal um, whilst you might be in a net sense storing liver glycogen, um, you still might have glycogen breakdown going on at about 50% of the rate of glycogen synthesis. So there's a lot of turnover happening and um, it probably allows the liver to adapt so quickly to changes in, in metabolism. Because if you're going from static... Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, it's quicker to quicker to respond. It's just another point I want to pick up on. You said with the uh, glycogen resynthesis. So we talked about the liver. We're going to get to the muscle, but just the thing you said about if you're exercising twice a day, whatever, whatever. I like the sound of that because I'm a bit of a fan of. I don't think people need to worry massively about getting 10 grams per kilogram every, you know, and have carbohydrate before exercise, during exercise, straight after it. I think your glycogen normally sort of ends up okay. And so do you want to just flesh that out? What you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes the message can be uh, taken out of the context of the athlete. Mm -hmm. And then you get the general population trying to maximize their glycogen resynthesis and get their carbs in straight after exercise no when yeah. for no reason, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, if you're just eating a, a diet with a normal amount of carbohydrate in, you may be trained once a day. Um, you don't really need to worry about maximizing that, that glycogen resynthesis. And, and actually there might be some, health or even adaptation benefits to to not replenishing it quite so quickly oh yeah do you want to just flesh that out a bit yeah and um so both we and others have, have done studies where we get people to exercise on one day and then we either replenish the carbohydrate that they burn during that exercise straight away or we keep them in this carbohydrate deficit then the next day we assess their glucose tolerance and their insulin sensitivity and um, when you don't replenish the carbohydrate that they've burned during exercise straight away, then you maintain insulin sensitivity better than if you replenish the carbohydrate straight away. And I mean, this this area, I was intrigued by then a recent paper that that I think you're an author on from Copenhagen, showing yeah. that the, the, in, the insulin sensitizing effects of exercise don't seem to correlate with the muscle glycogen concentration, which... <laughs> now gets me thinking what's Which, going on there <laughs> yes yeah, so i don't know so that was Jor jorgen Watachevsky from the university of copenhagen was the main guy on that and um i actually had him on the podcast as well and i was like wow that's because you you normally as you're alluding to there um if your glycogen's filled up already then you know why do you need to take up more glucose so it makes sense like you said if you if you exercise and you have lots of carbohydrate and the next day your glycogen's been resynthesize yeah. so then when you do an oral glucose tolerance test or a clamp or a meal test or whatever it doesn't have to go to glycogen so you know you don't take as much up so your insulin sensitivity looks like it's not as good um so yeah the assumption was there and and, and as he said for 20 years or whatever he's assumed it's glycogen but yeah. didn't find much correlation but as we sort of teased it out he was saying he'd only looked sort of acutely so you know three hours after exercise so maybe it's if you look longer you know yeah. Yeah. um you might start to see that but yeah that's pretty interesting so what are we saying there for liver and muscle glycogen resynthesis? So if we sum yeah. up, maybe the, the typical guidelines are if you want to maximize that resynthesis of glycogen, it's all based on the muscle literature, really. So um, it, it seems that if you're ingesting over about one gram per kilogram body mass per hour of carbohydrate, then you've maximized the rate of muscle glycogen resynthesis. And they, the advice is to typically do that for the first four hours after exercise. So that's one gram of carbohydrate per kilo body mass per hour. And it doesn't really matter too much on the type of carbohydrate that's ingested mm -hmm. for muscle glycogen resynthesis. Yep. For the liver, that's where the addition of fructose containing carbohydrates does seem to make a difference. Yep. We don't really know anything about the optimal dose for liver glycogen resynthesis. So the typical advice would be based the dose on what we know about muscle glycogen. And okay. you may as well include a mixture of glucose and fructose containing carbohydrates because they don't seem to affect muscle glycogen, but they do affect liver glycogen. So your total glycogen stores will be higher if you've got that mix of, cool. of carbohydrates. All right. And then just to reiterate, I guess, you know, people might be there writing down, I need one gram, but, but you're basically saying unless you're a, a, a sort of very serious athlete training twice a day, then most people, are you saying, can just eat a normal mixed diet and not worry about it. That's exactly. not the main factor. Exactly. That... And, and even athletes may not want to do that after every single training session. They might, obviously in a competition where you want to perform optimally, yes, you would aim for yes. that, but not in their everyday life. Yes, yes. All right. Now, the thing I, I sort of touched on earlier was we're talking about eating, but most of the studies you're talking about, you know, glucose. So they've just given them glucose only, which is not found in food, and then fructose only, and then um, sucrose, uh, you know, a mixture. So to clarify, sucrose is, you know, glucose and fructose. So it gets broken down. So you end up with both. What about 
food you know so what about so we're talking about eating so yeah. if you think about everything we've talked about which i know is probably a lot to, um do you get the same you know if you're just having a meal so if you have a meal yeah. with with you know this much carbohydrate versus this much whatever yeah. um i don't know yeah uh, it's a really good point because i mean we, we there's definitely some things we know but we know a lot less mainly because um traces that are used are normally glucose based traces and that's important to do because your tracer should be the same as your tracee um, but the problem with um, studying real food is that you then need to label the plant as it's growing so um, you need to label the starch within a potato or within the, the uh, wheat for the pasta or whatever you're studying it needs to be labeled within that food intrinsically mm. labeled and so that's a lot more expensive and difficult to do so there's a lot fewer studies on that and so we know less but we do know that um it will will affect things so the food matrix um will affect the digestion of of the carbohydrate so if you've got um for example a whole food um where the cells are intact or um the way the food has been prepared if you um process the food to multiple stages it's going to be normally more rapidly digested and absorbed and so you get um, an increase in that rate of appearance of glucose or fructose into the into the circulation that's true so what about um if we think about the exercise so if people are doing endurance type some maximum exercise um again i'm just thinking i'm imagining all these people drinking carbohydrate drinks and carbohydrate loading and whatever i want to hear what you think about if it's just like an hour of exercise even if it's hard, even like an hour time trial or, or an hour submax, do you think you need to be carbohydrate loaded? Do you need to be drinking sports drinks and things for, you know, I don't know, 45 minutes? It's, it's a bit of a, there's a bit of this argument about the cutoff, but yeah. you know what I'm getting at. What, what do you think yeah. about that? Are things maintained well enough? Does your glycogen run out within an hour of submax? Does your glucose drop within an hour of submax? Yeah, no, for, for most healthy people. I can see you shaking your head. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. that with for most healthy people with a normal amount of carbohydrate in their diet, they're going to have enough glycogen to begin with, probably to get through about 90 minutes of, of hard exercise before they get really low. Um, so yeah, not, not an issue with that intent. But there, there are some studies showing that um, maybe small ingestion of small amounts of carbohydrate could improve performance, even if it's not sparing glycogen in that scenario. Um, probably because of the taste of the carbohydrate in the mouth um there's some mm -hmm. suggestion there um but it's not nearly as the same size of the effect as when you ingest carbohydrate in prolonged exercise you can really affect performance there where it's providing a, a metabolic fuel as well as any other kind of signaling or anything that's going on exactly so so even if you're fasted you get up in the morning you don't have breakfast your liver will be able to maintain your glucose concentration for probably about an hour before it even starts to drop is that yeah exactly yeah so whilst your your liver is providing glucose to the brain overnight um it, it depletes a small amount by about 30 percent, but there's still plenty there to get get through that bout of exercise and your muscle glycogen will be pretty much the same as it was after your dinner the night before because overnight the muscle is mainly using fats as a fuel um it's not using and, and a bit of blood glucose uh, but it's not using the glycogen that's stored in the in the muscle all right so um you had a tweet about carbohydrate backloading what what is that what is that people see that what does that mean and what is what are we thinking about there yeah it seems like a, a popular strategy in some spheres where people think that they might get some advantage maybe for weight loss or performance by basically not eating any carbohydrates in the morning or lunchtime maybe they train in the late afternoon or evening and then they have all of their carbohydrates in the evening and i've also heard the opposite as well some people have all of their carbohydrates just in the morning and then um, none in the evening and with with the carbohydrate backloading i guess the the thoughts are um one that when you do your exercise without having had carbohydrates for quite a long time, then your rate of fat burning or fat oxidation will be higher than if you'd had carbohydrates before, which, which is true. Um, and then that if you've depleted your glycogen from the exercise, you're in a better scenario to have your carbohydrate rich meal and store that carbohydrate as glycogen. Um, in, in reality, it's quite interesting in terms of the blood glucose kinetics after exercise because um, well, Adam Rose probably did the first study on, on this where um, it was surprising that the blood glucose concentration in response to a meal 
um, after exercise can actually be higher mm -hmm. than if you haven't done the exercise. And mm -hmm. that's whilst you've got the increased glucose uptake into muscle, there's also changes with the liver and with the gut, which mean that the rate of appearance of glucose actually exceeds the rate of the increase in the rate of disappearance. And so you get this rise in, in glucose concentration. When I mention that to people, they sometimes worry. And I'm like, this doesn't mean that exercise is unhealthy. It's a, a normal physiological response. And actually, when others have then studied people with and without diabetes, this effect seems to be mainly in healthy people who don't have diabetes, mm. whereas people with diabetes don't show this effect and the exercise okay. lowers the glucose concentration. So not, not something to worry about, but it is an interesting physiological effect. Well, I should say, I mean, it's, it's, it, it sort of makes sense as well, right? So as Adam hypothesized at the time that you've used this glycogen during the exercise, you've had a meal and it, if it goes through the liver and actually makes a higher um, you know, glucose tolerance almost response, then then at rest, it's giving the muscle the first shot at it. Is that yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And along along similar lines, I see on Twitter, uh, I didn't used to use Twitter much, but it's just sort of now that I've got the podcast and everything, is you you want to get the message out and whatever. I see all these people worrying about glucose spikes, you know, like, oh, um, you know, don't eat potato because you get this glucose spike and everyone's running around with continuous glucose monitors on and everything. I, I have to admit, I haven't really looked in, into this properly, but my feeling is if you've got normal glucose, if you're, if you're healthy, a glucose spike is just normal physiology. It's not something like, oh, we've got to reduce our glucose spikes, everyone, you know, what do you, what yeah. do you think of that? Yeah, that, that's my current thinking as well. I'm, I mean, it also depends how you lower your glucose, because obviously you, you could have a completely flat glucose concentration if you just ate a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, but your triglycerides, your LDL cholesterol are probably increasing as well. So um, there are probably healthier and less healthy ways to, to lower a glucose concentration, but within a, within a normal range, it's unlikely that glucose spikes are, are doing anything, um, anything detrimental to our health. Um, once you get up to about 10 millimoles per liter and higher, and it's sustained hyperglycemia, mm. Then, that, then there's almost certainly some some potential damage going on there to, to blood vessels and things. But it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's kind of the classic thing where um, I remember I was trying to explain in these grant applications how, for example, when you exercise, you get free radicals produced and nitric oxide produced, for example, and saying that can be a good thing because it's short, temporal, it's having a signaling effect. And they're like, oh, but people with diabetes have elevated um, free radicals and elevated nitric yeah. oxide, and that's damaging. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing. If the glucose is up the whole time, sure. But if the glucose and insulin go up and, you know, just to, just to glucose go up, insulin goes up to bring it down again. Yeah. It's just life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And, you, and you, you get the same with insulin. I think sometimes people, um, and, and rightly so, like there are truth, some elements of truth in some of these things, right? So um, hyperinsulinemia, high insulin concentrations can cause insulin resistance. Um, but what's also not commonly um thought of in the same vein is that very low insulin a complete lack of insulin can also cause insulin resistance um, a small amount of insulin primes the system for insulin sensitivity and so um, the extremes on either end are, are probably not great but um, some insulin some glucose um, are probably good for general health which is what you're probably going to get with normal food you know if you're just sitting there saying i'm going to eat 400 figs then okay but you know most people don't do that so it's the same sort of thing you mentioned the glycemic index before, like, oh, you know, potatoes are high glycemic index, but you don't tend to just sit there eating potatoes, you know, yeah. you have a yeah. mixture, right? So, all right, so to come back to the thing I touched on earlier, which is the uh, most studies, uh, well, not necessarily most, but again, back in my day, all the carbohydrate digestion studies you did to see how it affected exercise performance and, you know, and glucose turnover, liver glucose output or whatever. We always did fasted, yeah. And I know you said it's hard, if you want to trace this, but how do you think that affects, you know, some of these results? So if you look at, say, for example, perform, I know you're not mainly performance guy, but you might say, oh, okay, carbohydrate ingestion um, during exercise improves performance if it's longer than an hour or whatever. But how much do you think that it's affected by, because if you're an athlete, you don't usually go out and do your race fasted, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I'm just yeah. wondering what you think about that. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, if we're studying either exercise or responses to meals, like you say, we normally study them in a fasted state. And yet we know that having a meal will affect our subsequent metabolic responses later in the day. And I think one of the best examples of this is is known as the second meal effects. Right. So okay. if you if you have if you study someone's response to their lunch, 
if they'd previously had breakfast, their insulin sensitivity, their glucose tolerance at lunch is better than if they hadn't had breakfast to begin with. And that's partly because of that insulin priming that I, I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that insulin primes the beta cells in the pancreas. So insulin secretions improved, but it also primes the liver and the muscle for glucose uptake. Um, and so that's one, one way in which breakfast or, or um, studying things in a postprandial state can influence it. But the studies with exercise performance have also been done. So ingesting carbohydrate during exercise does seem to improve prolonged performance in a fasted state, but it also improves it when you've already had a, a pre-exercise meal. So the, you get an additive effect on, on exercise performance there. Okay, yes. So if you have a you have breakfast and then you ingest carbohydrate during the exercise, you can do better. Yeah. The other thing I just thought of is, is another a study we did at Ball State where it was like a time trial uh, for two hours or whatever with with where they had they ate first. It was Jeff Widrick. So you have carbohydrate before oh no sorry carbohydrate loaded and then carbohydrate ingestion versus just carbohydrate loaded versus just carbohydrate ingestion versus neither mm -hmm. and it, the differences were i think it was like only three or four minutes where they did like a two-hour time trial from the best to the worst but then if you did like time to exhaustion i don't know if you want to flesh that out a little bit if you did time to exhaustion you might find they go an hour two hours longer or something trained athletes yeah. but if they're doing a time trial I don't know if you've thought about that much, but maybe just flesh that out a bit. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, some people do challenge the idea that time to exhaustion tests um, aren't relevant to, to real world performance. I, I'd argue against that. Actually, I think both are relevant just to different athletes mm -hmm. within different sports. Right. So if you think of marathon running or, or even professional cycling, there's quite often a pack or a peloton um, that are going together and up a climb in cycling or just in, in, a, in a marathon race, people start dropping off the back. And um, they're essentially doing a time to exhaustion test. Their, their pace is set by other athletes and they're trying to go for as trying long as they can. Or, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, whereas in other types of races, so there are time trials in cycling, um, then that is more like a time trial in the lab. It's not completely the same, of course, with, with extra external factors. But I think both are relevant. You, you do tend to see larger effects in time to exhaustion than you do in time trials and psychologically they're really different it's i prefer time trials to time to exhaustion oh, when yeah. you just don't know the end but oh um, yeah yeah <laughs> we had a classic study we had the study where we did um time to exhaustion with carbohydrate versus placebo and we um did we wanted to see if there was like a, a change in the muscle like um energy balance like was causing the fatigue mm -hmm. so we did the we did the, the placebo first and then we like, you stop them at the same time and then you get them to go longer. So when they had carbohydrate, it went longer. But I mean, one guy went three hours and um, and then we had this guy, the biopsy doctor across the road. He's a medical doctor and he had to run over across from the hospital and then do the biopsy. And we rang him up like three times to come over. <laughs> so he ran back again. The guy went three hours on placebo and he went five and a half on carbohydrate. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it's crazy. And that just another thing is just it reminded me. When he finished the placebo, he was wrecked. He had a shower and everything. And he said, I feel wrecked because he had had the hypoglycemia. But when he did the five and a half, he had a shower and he said, I feel like I could, I could do it again. Because, you know, yeah. he's not he's not dehydrated because we're drinking carbohydrate. Drinking, in both trials, you're drinking fluid. So he's not dehydrated. He's not hypoglycemic. And he's like, I feel good. So I think it's em emphasizing in a just a very, you know, practical way how good these yeah. things are for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, actually, another thing that just occurred to me, uh, carbohydrate ingestion during exercise, how it's affecting the liver, glucose mm -hmm. output. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess if we compare that to what we know about muscle, in, in most scenarios, it seems like ingesting carbohydrate during exercise doesn't spare muscle glycogen. So you use pretty much the mm -hmm. same amount of muscle glycogen. Um, whereas if you ingest carbohydrate during exercise, then liver glycogen can be spared at at least when you're ingesting relatively large amounts. Um, it doesn't seem to matter too much on the type of carbohydrate there that you ingest. Um, but yeah, you can actually completely prevent liver glycogen depletion with moderate intensity exercise and large carbohydrate intake. So maybe that's one of the mechanisms by which carbohydrate ingestion does improve exercise performance. Oh, I'm really happy you said I, I've People can't see it, but I'm nodding along the whole time here. That's really interesting. So yeah, in our my PhD, so we did this double tracer. So you had one tracer you infused in the, and then another one we had in the drink. And we actually hypothesized that. We said, because when we did do the biopsy at fatigue, you couldn't see anything in the muscle. Mm -hmm. 
And we're like wondering, wonder if there's some sort of sensor that when you're drinking carbohydrate, you're sparing your liver glycogen. Wonder if there's some sort of sensor to tell the tell the brain that, hey, things are looking pretty good here. Yeah. Because your fatigue, even though your glucose is still like five, you know, you're drinking carbohydrate, everything's everything's fine. And Eddie Coyle, he was on earlier a, a while back as well. He did the classic study where, as you said, generally carbohydrate doesn't spare glycogen, but then they just keep going. You know, you maintain your carbohydrate oxidation, yeah. you've got higher glucose uptake. So why do you stop? I'm not, I'm not suggesting you would know the answer, but has someone actually, has someone actually been talking about that? The liver, there's like a liver sensor or? Yeah. The, so in humans, it's obviously quite hard to understand the, the causal role of liver glycogen. There are some mm. interesting studies in, in rodents where they, um, they genetically increased liver glycogen concentration using um, a genetic mutation of protein targeted to glycogen that was liver specific. So they basically end up with higher liver glycogen concentrations in both fasted and fed states, but similar muscle glycogen concentrations. Uh -huh. And when they exercise them to exhaustion, they can run for longer when they've got the higher liver glycogen compared to the lower liver glycogen, because that's a genetic ma manipulation. It's quite an, an isolated effect on liver glycogen. Uh -huh. It seems to suggest that, that it does play a role there. I would say the, the caveat, I guess, is that um, it seems that rodents use more blood-based fuels than muscle-based fuels. And so exactly. maybe maybe we can't translate that to humans, but yeah, it's probably the closest we can get so far. We should get them drinking carbohydrate as they're running as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been going great. What I might do now is switch to there's a there's a few uh, bit of interest on Twitter, which was great. So I asked people if they have any questions. So there's a few here. Don't mind, don't mind if I read them out here. Uh, I think Pierre Parquet or Parquet or something. I'm sure I've messed that up. If I plan a low intensity training long duration, like less than VT1 or 70% FTP, is so a fractional uh, functional threshold power, should I take less carbohydrate before and during the event? as my body should use more lipid as energy. Also, how long can I train at this intensity fasted? So we've sort of talked about this stuff a bit, but I guess it sort of brings it together. Yeah, Get I guess what right? we haven't, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. What I guess what we haven't mentioned is that role of in exercise intensity. So True. Um, they are right that at the lower exercise intensities, we'll be using more fat and less carbohydrate as a fuel. Um, but even below um, the threshold they, they suggested there, whilst fat will be a major source of fuel, there'll be some carbohydrates still being used. And so really it depends on that duration. So you're probably fine at a very low intensity if you're well-trained to easily get through three hours. Um, mm. But you probably struggle with a six hour ride, for example, you would be getting low on, on glycogen then. Um, but it also depends on the, the aim of that session. So you might want to finish that session depleted, or you might want to finish with good glycogen stores so that you still feel fresh for another day's training the next day. Um, how long you can go fasted will really depend on your pre-exercise glycogen stores. And that'll mm -hmm. depend on how much carbohydrates been in your diet, but also your endurance training status. So if you're a well-trained athlete for any given amount of carbohydrate in the diet, you'll probably be starting with more muscle glycogen. You've got a greater capacity to store glycogen. And then it depends on how slow you'll use those glycogen stores during the exercise. So if you've got a high capacity for fat oxidation, then you'll be using those glycogen stores a bit more slowly. Exactly. Yep. And actually, I just look, I've got the benefit of having it right here in front of me. Also, how long can I train at this intensity fasted? So I think we've sort of covered that earlier that, you know, I said even the Woodrick study, you know, when they did the time trial for two hours, you know, fasted, no carbohydrate, they were only like four minutes slower than the carbohydrate load and carbohydrate gestured. So you can do, you can do okay. But like, as you said, it depends how long you go, yeah. how much glycogen you've got, exactly. um, how long you fasted. So um, yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. There's another one um, here, Dion or Dion does ingesting carbohydrate. Well, I don't know if you know this one. It's a lactate thing. Uh, does ingesting carbohydrate before a lactate test affect readings? If so, is the best protocol for morning maximal test to ensure good glycogen stores the day before? Yeah, uh, well, carbohydrate can affect lactate in, in at least two ways. So when we eat any type of carbohydrate, we're gonna get a, an increase in lactate because of the increase in glycolytic flux. Um, so the pyruvate will get shunted to, to lactate. So the glycogen um, breakdown will be quicker. Yeah, just to, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. 
Um, but also if that meal contains some fructose in it, then that fructose, part of that fructose will get converted into lactate as well. And I guess this is a nice, really nice example, actually, of um, the uncoupling of lactate from fatigue. So in both of these scenarios, either ingesting carbohydrate during exercise or specifically fructose, you're going to get higher lactate concentrations, but you're going to delay fatigue and, and actually feel better. So just on a side note, it's, it's mm-hmm. a nice example of that. It is. But for, for a, a lactate threshold test, again, it, it so the amount of glycogen you've got to begin with will, will influence that. And so you do want to standardize it um, across athletes or within the athlete when you, whenever you're testing them. Exactly right. So the idea is you... You would come in, you know, for the testing or if you're doing it at home or whatever you're doing it, um, standardize everything, you know, sleep, how much sleep you had, how, what you've eaten, your hydration. Ideally, you do the same temperature because temperature stimulates glycogen. If it's hot, you get great, greater glycogen. I know, within reason, you try and standardize things. And then if it does look different, you might think, well, I wonder if it's this or that rather than I'm this fit or something. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, there was a thing I wanted to ask. Oh, yeah, okay uh you know how there's a bit of a thing at the moment like athletes are you know kipchoge even wearing continuous glucose monitors and you know there's a lot of people flogging continuous glucose monitors all over the place and sort of saying you know everyone can benefit and I'm, I'm interested in your you know I, I, there's no right or wrong answer but um i personally I, when I've, I've i do these sabbaticals at the university of copenhagen and we actually included some in this massive study of biopsies and av balance across the leg we stuck some on the on the leg and on the on the arm and whatever and it was really interesting and i did some myself to have a look and it's interesting what do you think about this this idea that um you know people of, of first of all everyone using continuous glucose monitors versus athletes versus yeah. obviously type 2 diabetics and type 1 whatever yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so i guess the scientist in me would love to measure everything all the time um mm-hmm. i guess we do need to think about how first how accurate the devices are are they measuring what we want them to measure um and then for the for the average person what can they do with that information um in terms of that accuracy they're they're getting better all the time that then it's probably worth remembering they're not measuring blood glucose concentration they're measuring it in the interstitial fluid and so there are some potential differences there especially under conditions where you've got rapid changes in flux um, mm-hmm. such as after a meal or during exercise um in terms of what we can do with that information again it, it it does need a bit of careful consideration so i think they can be useful for testing certain things out again if you've standardized conditions and so on but in daily life it's pretty tricky to know what's the cause of any change you see and so um yeah maybe over time with um if you've compared yourself and you've eaten the same breakfast each day and you've manipulated one thing you might be able to detect things but you might only be able to detect that if you, for example, have diabetes where you're going to get large changes in glucose rather than if you don't have diabetes where those changes are going to be much more subtle. And I guess it goes back to one of the points we raised at the start where there could be changes in flux that aren't detected in the change in, in glucose concentration. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think we'd all we'd all agree that for some of the type 1 diabetes and potentially some of the type 2 diabetes, you know, for a couple of weeks or something, but I, you know, what about like every athlete? Yeah, I think you're saying no, or yeah. I mean, I don't want to put I, words in your mouth, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say hard no, but I, um, yeah, I like personally, if I was an athlete, I probably wouldn't be choosing it to wear it all the time. But I, just just out of interest, I'd, I'd probably still wear it now and again and just just see yeah, what's exactly. going on, just to confirm things. But, yeah. All right, so you've rapidly rose to professor, and you've everything I've asked you, you've just nailed. So obviously, whenever you do research. It all works, right? So whenever you have a hypothesis or whatever, you, you get what you expect, and and you know everything's happy days. Is that is that right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and and if we knew everything before we started the experiment, there's no point in doing the experiment, right? So, exactly. um, um, yeah, I guess one one example would be during my PhD. Um, there was at that time a few studies suggesting that calcium might influence fat oxidation, um, and I wanted to see if that was the case so ran a, quite a few studies in humans acute and chronic supplementation fasted fed that kind of thing and um saw absolutely nothing going on with fat oxidation but um i was lucky in that i took a few exploratory outcomes as well and found some interesting effects on on the increase in hormones the glp1 and, and gip 
um, that led down another avenue of research. So um, yeah, kind of a, I guess what I learned from that is study your primary aim, but try and back it up either with an interesting third comparison or with different outcome measures so that you're, you're kind of covering your bases and you might have other angles to go down if, oh, nice. um, if your primary doesn't come out. And keep your eyes open as well, yeah? Exactly, you know, like, yeah. like don't just say, oh, that's that's ridiculous or that, you know, follow your, follow the data, I guess. Yeah. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, now I wanted to ask you this as well, but Jeff Rothschild, who's, who's a good lad, uh, he's doing his PhD in New Zealand. Uh, he said, I'd love to know uh, what are you, what are some of the most important pressing questions uh, you're looking at to answer in your research or even even more generally what you're looking at but even like what do you think's hot what do you th what do you think we need to look at you know yeah i mean the, the the stuff we mentioned earlier about the relationship between glycogen and insulin sensitivity i think now needs more work to understand what's yes, going true. on there um, mm -hmm. <laughs> i haven't got anything directly planned on that but i'd love to know if actually there's a, a liver involvement in that exercise induced improvement in insulin sensitivity whether there's anything going on with glucose effectiveness um, mm -hmm. rather than insulin sensitivity, that kind of thing. But I guess aside to that, things we things we have got going on um, are a few studies on manipulating uh, the sugar content of the diet or the total carbohydrate content of the diet. So people basically go on a ketogenic, very low carbohydrate diet, or they maintain their carbohydrate intake, but they drastically restrict their sugar intake. How does that affect their energy balance behaviors? So does carbohydrate play a role in our propensity to be more or less physically active does it play a role in our energy intake um, and independent of that does it affect our, our health as well so our metabolic health um, so I'm, I'm really interested in in, in that area and yeah we've oh, got so you're some... thinking oh sorry so you're thinking if you ketogenic diet or a high carbohydrate diet may affect your likelihood of being physically active or was that part yeah, of it yeah 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 and the, okay. the, i guess the, the the rationale for that comes from a few human studies that we've done and also some mechanistic rodent studies where um in the human studies we've we've studied people in response to skipping breakfast or eating breakfast and also with um alternate day fasting mm -hmm. and what we find in those scenarios is when they're fasting they're less physically active and it's the kind of low intensity activity it's not your exercise it's just the the little things that add up over the day but, but add up to quite a substantial amount um, they can do. Um, so we don't know what's causing that. It could be a number of things, but the reason we think it might be carbohydrate availability specifically is because of some studies in rodents, again, with that liver uh, glycogen manipulation by a genetic mutation, mm. um, when they've got higher liver glycogen in that scenario, they're more physically active as well. Um, so there's at least a mechanistic link in rodents. There's some kind of, um, fuzzy observational data in humans mm. and so we're now trying to to directly manipulate that a little bit closer in, in humans that's a funny one actually because i was thinking when you said rodents i was thinking of something else I, I i couldn't hang my hat on it or whatever you say but i remember at one stage someone was saying when when rodents have fasted i thought they were more active because they wanted like run around to find food um, so that might be wrong or it might be worth. Well, I guess there's an interaction, right? So so it could yeah. be like in there, could, there are signals in the fasted state that could drive mm -hmm. them to be physically active. But when they're fasted and you manipulate the liver glycogen, maybe yes, that could, that's a could have a role there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking also I had um, Herman Ponser on and he was talking about hunter gatherers and things. Yeah. And again, I think if you if you depends the other thing it might depend how long you are fasted so if you're like starving yeah. it's like i'm going to yeah. die unless i get physically active and go and you know yeah. find some food <laughs> yeah yeah that's exactly. interesting yeah. yeah one thing i was thinking um before as well we talk about liver you know releasing glucose during exercise so i guess if we think of fasted yeah so you start exercise how how is the liver uh, how does it manage maintaining the glucose concentration like how much does it release from the glycogen so that's glycogenolysis breaking down glycogen and how much is what you mentioned earlier as well, the, the gluconeogenesis? As a proportion, when you first start exercising, it's about 50-50. Um, and um, as you go through exercise, you're going to start to run out of liver glycogen stores. And so the proportional contribution from gluconeogenesis could end up being almost 100% if, if the exercise is very long or if you've fasted for a very long time. Um, okay. But as an, as an absolute rate, um, the gluconeogenesis at least in most healthy humans, in most scenarios, seems to be relatively stable from, from what I've seen. Um, 
And so what's happening is the total rate of appearance of glucose out of the liver has has decreased mm -hmm. over time. Um, and the contribution has has changed from each of those those sources. OK, so you're saying that basically the gluconeogenesis starts off about 50 50, but it, it, the absolute rate stays about the same. But the yeah. glycogen starts to run down, that becomes less. And then obviously after an hour or so, your glucose will drop unless you have like a carbohydrate drink or something. Is that yeah, fair to exactly. say? Yeah. All right. I guess the intensity would have, would affect it as well. If we intended to sort of say endurance exercise, and we talked about time trials a bit here and there, but we, we, we've yeah. basically been talking about submaxed, you know, I guess it depends if you're doing like a, a 30 minutes or an hour flat out time trial or something like that, or even shorter, you know, why don't you say what happens there? You get adrenaline release and whatever. How does that affect, you know, the liver? Yeah. It, so as you increase exercise intensity, you increase the contribution of carbohydrate as a fuel. Uh, that's both muscle glycogen use, but also liver glycogen use. And um, the main one of the main stimuli for that is is the adrenaline response to the exercise. So it's actually you can get a, an interesting quirk where if you were to do a short sprint and then immediately mm -hmm. stop exercise, you can get a rise in your blood glucose concentration because the liver is now putting out glucose you haven't got that such an increase in muscle glucose uptake because you've just stopped the exercise. So you can get a, a rise in glucose, just like you've had a meal. Yeah, that's amazing. People don't, people don't usually get that. So yeah, you, you do a sprint, even a 30 second sprint, five minute sprint, the glucose will actually continue because the liver keeps pumping it out when you stop. Yeah. And that's another one. It sounds like I'm just trying to, uh, you know, flog my podcast, but Michael Rodell, I think he's an expert on type one diabetes and exercise. And I think he was the second the third person on the podcast and uh yeah he was saying how you know you can imagine how how difficult that would be with people with type 1 diabetes where yeah. you know even if you've got the insulin pumps the glucose pumps and it's like hang on a minute the glucose is elevating and so it wants to release more insulin but the exercise is, is going to stimulate the insulin sensitivity yeah. so it becomes a real a real tricky one yeah, yeah exactly right. yeah Cool. All right. Now, one other thing you mentioned the, I, I held off before, but because you mentioned it twice, I thought I might throw it in there. So, you know how we talked about if you look at insulin sensitivity after exercise, it looks like it's not, um, you know, it may not be glycogen, but maybe if you go longer. Well, one thing we did is the studies I did over there in Copenhagen, we did exercise and then we do a clamp, which is where, as you know, you infuse glucose. Um, you, you, so just say, just so people understand, just say glucose is five millimole. The Americans will just have to work it out with it. They need to get to get metric one day. Um, five millimoles per liter. And then you do the exercise, right? And then you infuse glucose and insulin and you look at insulin sensitivity. So if you infuse insulin at the same rate, um, you know, for everyone, then the more insulin sensitive you are, the more you'll take up glucose. So then you need to infuse the glucose at a higher rate to maintain that five millimole. Now, the thing we realized there was, was you get some really weird, so you exercise and then you do the clamp. You have higher glucose uptake, you have higher blood flow, but the interstitial glucose, so actually in the muscle, not the, you know, you're talking about with the continuous glucose monitors, it's only on the fat, it drops. And we're like, hang on, this is really weird. And then realized what it is, is because you're clamping the glucose at five millimole. Mm -hmm. That is not physiological. So as we talked about earlier, you have a meal normally, what's going to happen to the meal? When you have a meal, the glucose goes up. Yeah. So it's a bit of a sneak preview for people. So we're doing a study at the moment, doing exactly the same. So you do one leg of exercise and then the other one rests. And then you wait four hours, you have a meal instead of a clamp, you know? So yeah. I don't know, this is me talking. So why don't you, why don't you explain to people what I'm I talking mean, about there? <laughs> yeah, really good points. <laughs> There's a load of different differences between the clamp and a, a meal, right? You've just mentioned a few there. There's also, when you orally ingest a meal, the intestine is going to sense those nutrients and release um, these incretin hormones, and they will potentiate insulin secretion, so glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. So um, if you were to intravenously infuse glucose, even to match the pattern that you would get after a meal, the insulin response is lower than if you ingested that glucose mm -hmm. orally. So that's another way in which... Um, having a meal is very different to the clamp scenario. And again, as with most things, it just depends on the aim of the study, right? So exactly. for some aims, you want the clamp, for, some, for others, you'd, you'd rather give a meal. Well, I think that's where it got a bit tricky because we we sort of wrote in that paper that, oh, interstitial glucose drops, maybe it's because this isn't this. 
but not saying, oh, maybe it's just the clamp. You know, we were sort yeah. of making out like it was normal physiology. Yeah. But if you say, well, for meal, maybe because the glucose goes up, the interstitial glucose does. So, you know, it doesn't seem like it does drop when you have a meal. So it's totally yeah. different. And you actually end up with higher glucose uptakes than you okay. do with a clamp, which fits with what you said as well, because you'd have more insulin secretion. All right. So have we covered everything uh, that we wanted to cover? Oh, yeah. OK. So just talking about other bits and pieces that you've done. Um, you mentioned the ketone diet before. So I saw this is a totally well, it's a bit of a different twist. I saw you've had a paper there where you had ketone ester ingestion increasing EPO. Yeah, so erythropoietin. Yeah. Why don't you flesh that one out for us? Because that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so uh, e EPO or EPO is is the main hormone that um, controls uh, the amount of red blood cells that we have, and um, was as the drug form was abused, obviously by many endurance athletes to to increase their. Oh, it was was is it? Okay, or was or, or, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're, we're idealists. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and and it's the reason why one of the reasons why a lot of people still do altitude training because when you go to altitude uh that will stimulate the, the production of epo and and should mm -hmm. maintain um the amount of hemoglobin that we have um with with ketones we we kind of got interested in this area because there's a suggestion that um if you go on a ketogenic diet there are some markers of maybe increased um hematocrit hemoglobin concentration we weren't sure if that was a true increase in hemoglobin mass because there's changes in plasma volume and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but combining that with other scenarios, so uh, people with diabetes who take certain types of drugs have also been shown to both increase the ketone body concentrations and um, hematocrit and, and hemoglobin concentrations. And so we thought, well, let, let's just have a little look here. What's going on? So... Um, we gave people these ketone esters after a, a bout of exercise to mimic a training session um, versus a, a placebo controlled condition. And when they had the ketone esters, we got an increase in their natural production of, of EPO after that um, exercise session compared to placebo. Wow. And, and do you know what's going on there? Yeah. So the, the mechanism, we're, we're not sure. Um, we're, we're following up with a, a few more studies to try and understand that. It, it could be something to do with um, histone acetylation, so kind of a signaling effect of the ketones. It could be um, an indirect effect by uh, changing plasma volume. So we know that ketone esters might reduce urine output. So you might get a better maintenance of plasma volume, and that could have a kind of a hemodilution effect and maybe stimulate EPO production that way. But um, yeah, we're, we're really not sure at the moment. Oh, okay. So again, mentioning Twitter, people all over the place, keto diets, uh, whatever. So I can't let you go without, um, I feel like you're a bit of a more carbo man than a keto. So you think people should be endurance athletes and whatever you think they should be on these high keto diets. Um, I mean, most endurance athletes, certainly up to kind of Olympic distance events, I think it's pretty clear that a high carbohydrate diet is, is the better, better option there. Um, I think it's different if we're talking about the general population, maybe less physically active. I think there's a role for either type of diet there. I, I personally do prefer a higher carbohydrate, low fat diet. I find that easier to maintain weight on. Um, other people may find it easier on a lower carbohydrate diet. So I'm kind of open minded. I'm, I'm interested mm -hmm. in studying both. But certainly for, for endurance athletes that are doing hard, high intensity exercise up to about two hours, it, but even Tour de France cyclists going with racing up to six hours with the high intensity efforts, it's pretty clear that they're reliant on, on carbohydrate as a fuel there. Yeah, I guess we haven't really said, we've sort of touched on it, it's been implied, but you know, we've we've made it clear that we, we want to have high, high glycogen, you want to have high liver gly glycogen, you know, and oh, it's going to drop at this rate. So I guess we haven't really said it, but the implication is if your glycogen drops and your glucose drops, you'll generally have to drop your power output. Is that a fair, fair summary? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and for a few reasons, it makes sense to try and maintain that, that glycogen during mm -hmm. exercise. Great. All right. So if we're going to finish up with a few sort of take home messages and whatever, I know we covered a lot of ground, but uh, so a few sort of take homes that we, we, you know, you'd want someone to get out of this chat. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess one is um, that when we eat a meal or when we do some exercise, we might see a change in the blood glucose concentration or we might not. 
but we should always remember that there's a flux that underlies that and um, that might tell us a different story than just the glucose concentration. Um, so we should think about more around that scenario. So I guess that's more for the, the scientists. Mm -hmm. um, for um, someone just interested in, in exercise and activity then uh, and, and staying healthy, then any form of exercise is a really powerful way to manipulate our, our glucose metabolism and better control our, our glucose after meals and make sure we remain insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the timing in which we have that meal in relation to exercise can also play a role. So if, you, if you've had your meal, you do some exercise, that's a powerful way to lower the glucose concentration immediately. But if you're regularly physically active, you, then you've got um, good glucose control because of that increase in physical fitness and the adaptations within the muscle. Yeah, great. All right. So it is also, I guess the other thing I was thinking, is it also fair to say, because someone could listen to this and go, oh my gosh, it's so complicated. I've got to do this. I've got to eat this and drink that. And well, not drink, but well, you know, drink carbohydrate drinks or have carbohydrate loaded, but hang on. Am I doing longer than an hour, less than an hour? Is it fair to say that they people, the, the average person on a normal mixed diet, not energy deficient diet and and not doing massive you know the the average kind of punter that's well i don't know if that's a saying you, you probably say it in england but americans maybe not your average joe or whatever going to the gym doing some exercise not doing massive amounts doesn't have to actually worry about all this and just get out there and do it is that is that a fair summation i think um, yeah it's a fair, fair to say any any form of exercise uh, i do mm -hmm. like to think of it um a bit like diet that variety is good so yes. um yeah, there mix it go. up if you can, but something's better than nothing. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. I was, I was, I was thinking, I don't usually do gallery, but, um, you know, I just do speak of you, but if they were, they'd, people would see me nodding the whole time. So, <laughs> but, but then again, I sort of wonder if we're agreeing on everything and we've both done this stuff and we think, oh yeah, it sounds like we kind of know what everything, you know, like, I don't mean, it sounds like we know that you should do this diet and this diet now. Yeah. But I think when you start to think like that, you have to say, well, hang on a minute, because everything's always more complicated. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. And um, I, I do I do quite like um, discourse and debate. So always happy to, to have a chat with someone who disagrees with me. I think it's, it's healthy to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> I did with Herman Ponzo, if you go back and look at that one, but uh, I couldn't disagree with most of this stuff. Well, thank you very much for coming on. You obviously, obviously know your stuff and uh, it's really interesting. So thanks again for come, joining. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, good on you. See you, mate. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.